Hi guys and welcome to this week's episode of The Deep Dive and uh, obviously remember if you haven't done so already make sure you hit the buttons working hit that subscribe and that notification bell you'll be notified every time we go live on the Alex Sam YouTube channel with a new video and that can include the deep dives or any other shows we've got going on um, also Harry's day-to-day -day little uploads so today on the show we have got someone who I have known about for I would say maybe a good 15 to 20 years we've never actually met personally um, but I always knew this guy as a bit of a bizarrist so we're going to go into a bit of the history and what he does and let's introduce him to everyone um, so ladies and gentlemen the guest on this week's deep dive is the fantastic Mr Neil Tobin how are you mate doing great thanks so much for inviting me you are more than welcome so you're on here because you've got a brand new product out which we're going to speak uh, a little bit about later on um but i i wanted to to chat to you really because i became aware of you i think we spoke back in the day maybe when the assassin come out or things like that you you were a big um poster on the the green forum at that stage i don't know if you're still on there i don't see your name about as much on there yeah very little like <laughs> many people i think now um but i always knew you neil as a um as a sort of bizarrist at at the time so tell us a little bit about you and your history in magic and and where you were where you are now well you're absolutely right uh, i mean I, like i'm sure a lot of the people that I know in the magic community. I was a boy magician where I was doing a whole bunch of everything uh, and then laid off magic for a good chunk of time. And then when I came back to it as an adult, reevaluated the repertoire and what really fit me and what I really wanted to do. And I found that I was gravitating towards mentalism and the bizarre. Yeah. So, you know, I read everything I could in those areas. And fortunately, I live in Chicago. So I was able, after developing a stand-up at the theater show called Supernatural Chicago, was able to invite Eugene Berger and struck up a friendship with him. Oh, wow. Uh, and so got mentorship in that regard. Incredibly fortunate. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you so don't my work, anyone better than Eugene. Certainly not. Uh, so, so I was able to do, uh, in that show, a mixture of bizarre and mentalism. Um, and in multiple other theater shows, the same thing. I've also, in terms of experience, performed stand-up shows for private and corporate events. And you know, per the current release, uh, obviously a whole lot of walk around. Yeah. So is, is the sort of bizarre still a big part of your performing repertoire? Is that still your, your main performance? It, you know, it's... Uh, because bizarre is such a, a large envelope into which you can tuck so many other things. I mean, yeah. it's really a way of performing mentalism. It's a way of performing even straight ahead magic, if you're allowed to, uh, by wrapping it in a story that's emotional. And yeah. so as a theater artist, I'm just always trying to connect emotionally in some way. And I mean, my most recent stage show, my most recent theater show was a site specific performance that explored our relationship with mortality which i know sounds really heavy but yeah. it was done with a light touch and it was actually performed site specifically in the chapel of a historic cemetery wow. and went over great but it wasn't ooh scary spooky blood guts you know what a lot of people tend to associate as being bizarre it's yeah about emotional contact and sometimes hitting some pretty serious subjects yeah yeah, I mean, uh, obviously a very good friend of mine, Jamie Dawes, does the same thing. It's, you know, it doesn't always have to be scary. It's just a really good story. It's something that connects. Um, and it's usually a little bit deeper, um, you know, when, when you're performing it. So how often do you have your own show then? Is it something you do regularly? Like put on well, a I mean, since, show? since pandemic, it, I... I'm working on putting together my next one. Uh, my Supernatural Chicago show, 
I ran every week in Chicago for 10 years. Wow. Wow. Well, and, and this was at a time when Chicago didn't have a standing weekly show for the public to visit. I was kind of staking out new territory there. Now, thank goodness, uh, there's a thriving magic community that's putting up public shows, but such was not the case when I, when I put up mine. And uh, I closed that down to put up a new show that I wanted to do that was a biographical show about the German mentalist, uh, Eric Jan Hannison. Yeah. And uh, that was called Pals of the Occult. And that did well. And it was it was it was a biography. It was a, it was a two act play that incorporated uh, my interpretations of some of his repertoire. But really, it's a biography and it was totally immersive. The audience that attended was playing the part of the audience attending opening night of his Palace of the Occult in Berlin in 1933. Wow. So I got to welcome them as Hannison, as my guests, and they see me set up for the grand opening and I involve them in stories and demonstrate some of the repertoire. And then it culminated in the big seance that he was conducting that evening, which goes horribly wrong. That it sounds amazing. I mean, when you were doing the, uh, the 10 year run, so was that in a, a a theater or had you found a function room or uh, you know I out? found that I really like doing work that's site specific because yeah. when an audience arrives in an authentic place they sense that and you can spend a million dollars in a theater trying to replicate it but it's not going to feel the same so yeah. I got to do a show about Chicago's paranormal history in a building that had a strong reputation as being haunted. Wow. Yeah, so it was it was in a, a room of a nightclub that was, <laughs> well, it was the building was built to be the original home of the Chicago Historical Society. It's on the National Registry of Historic Places. It's this big, beautiful Romanesque, it looks like a decommissioned church. It's amazing. Yeah. And uh, so I got to perform in there. And I mean, anybody who's watching this who has done Bizarre knows if you can send, if you can set the atmosphere before they even get to you, you're miles ahead. Yeah. And this place yeah. was absolutely that. Yeah, we we used to have over here. I, I'm not sure if he's still in business, but I know about 20, 25 years ago, there was a company over here called the Black Heart, and oh, they used. I to remember. Do, I remember them. Yeah, and they used to yeah. do a lot of the bizarre stuff. Now he used to do, obviously, he used to do lectures for magic clubs. And I remember going to see him. And once again, you're exactly right. He would set the scene. So when you walked in, there would be smoke. There would be music. And even though you're in your normal club room, it made such a difference because you, you were sort of whisked away in, into the world that he was creating, which was really good. So here's something that I think a lot of people would be interested in as well, is how do you go about finding a venue for a show and also pitching the show to the venue. Was this something that you just went in and booked a room and said, look, I want this room. I'm going to pay you a hundred dollars a week or whatever. Or did you approach them and do some sort of collaboration? If someone wanted to put on a show, not specifically a bizarre show, just any show, how, how would they go about that? How would they find a venue? And well, I mean, and that's a great question. And it depends on what your needs are for the show itself. Uh, for Supernatural Chicago, from a technical standpoint, I didn't need a whole lot of lights and sound and lots of cues. And I didn't need to control the environment very much. The subsequent yeah. show, the, the Palace of the Occult show, that I needed a theater because I knew that I would need projections and light and sound cues and even a, some supporting players. And the... Yeah. The sort of environment that only a theater would allow me. Uh, and then the show after that, Near Death Experience, which was at the, the historic cemetery. Again, I decided to strip it back so that it wouldn't require a great deal and that I could just enjoy the atmosphere of the space that I was doing it in. Uh, so question number one is, what are your technical needs? Uh, then question number two is, would site specific be an option for you? Uh, I Sorry, I'm divulging a huge secret of mine, which is 
uh, that I love site specific. And one of the great things about it is it doesn't cost as much as renting a theater uh, most of the time, uh, especially if you can phrase it to the owners of that space as being a benefit to them in some way. When I did Supernatural Chicago, it was an Excalibur Night Club. It's not, it's not called that anymore. But at the time it was. And I had originally contacted them because I was president of the, of the Society of American Magicians in Chicago. And we had done as a fundraiser one year around Halloween time, I had proposed, it's Halloween time, Houdini died on Halloween, and I'm tired of hearing that we have no money. So how about we stage a Houdini seance? And they said, great, you're it. So I wrote a show and staged it for them. And it did great, but it was out in the suburbs. And we didn't get a whole lot of people, but the people who came loved it. And we even got some press coverage. So I knew that the following year, step one was to get a better venue, someplace more central where people would actually go see it. So I, the first place that came to my mind was this location in Chicago with a haunted reputation. It was a nightclub. So I pitched it to them in a way that they would be interested in, which was, look, Halloween is not falling on a major night for you. It's on a Sunday night this year. And I could get people in to see this and we can include the cost of a drink or two as part of the admission and they could stay and potentially drink more. And you see all this press that we got last year? What if we were able to do the same thing for you? It's win-win. So they said, okay, let's give it a try. And I did, and it was, we sold out and we got great press. And next thing I know, I'm hearing from them saying, yeah, um, what can you do the rest of the year? And I had already been thinking about that myself. So I was able to pitch Supernatural Chicago, which was, well, nice place you got here. It's haunted. So how about we start with that and then spool it out into other stories of the paranormal, of documented haunted locations and things that have happened in the city uh, and make it interactive through magic and mind reading and you got yourself a show. And they said, great. And I put it up and that was it, 10 years. I can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute. So, um, yeah, so the rest is history, as they say. So with the... Um, I did have a question that come to mind, and now my mic being muted threw me off. Let me just think for one second. Uh, I can't remember. It's going to come back to me at some point. It's going to come back well, at some uh, point. But would you like to know how I got the how I was able to do the show in the cemetery? Yes. But, okay. Oh no, this is there. You go. Hang on. This was the question before you go into that. So, with regards to the people that were coming to see the show, were they tourists visiting Chicago, or were they locals? What what it was what a, do it was you a think your breakdown? Uh, uh, I would say that it was probably seventy five percent out of towners, and about twenty five percent local. Uh, because I was, the location is right in the heart of the city's downtown, surrounded by hotels. It's a big, it's a building you can't miss. It's across the street from the Hard Rock Cafe in Chicago. It's, if you're a tourist staying in that area, you can't miss it. So, uh, and I was getting listings in TripAdvisor, which it, at the time, TripAdvisor was in its infancy. My show was one of the top 10 things to do in Chicago at the time. Wow. Well, which, you know, <laughs> I can take part responsibility for that people really liked it, but also because TripAdvisor was in its infancy. I think I think we were ahead of the Art Institute of Chicago, which gives you some idea of how ridiculous that is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it was getting, it got a lot of buzz. And I personally went to all the, all the local hotels with, leave behinds so that they could give things to their guests and really really encourage those relationships yeah no, that's great so go on then moving on to the cemetery yeah well i knew that i wanted to do a show about mortality uh because i didn't want to after i closed palace of the occult i didn't do a, a show that would just be you know supernatural chicago part two i wanted to do something different and and hit some something perhaps a little deeper and i thought about it and thought about okay well when we tell ghost stories 
why do we do it? What is that about? And and really, it's a coping me mechanism for us to talk about death in a safe way. Yeah, I mean, that's really what it is. Yeah. So I figured, let's roll up our sleeves and dig into that and ended up writing a whole show about it. And now in order to do that, I had to take the audience on, on a journey. So the beginning of it has to be as non threatening as possible, because we're going to go deeper and deeper, and it's got to be progressive. So I'd start with a folk story um, from it was a tribal story from Ethiopia, actually, uh, which is about a trickster character who tries to make his way up to heaven. And it, it culminates with essentially, and this is why we have death. This is why it exists. It's because yeah. of it, it within that culture, that's the story. And then gently lead them through and how do we cope with it and what do we do about it and why, what makes us safe and why are, have we, uh, how have we cushioned ourselves from it? What, what, what are the methods for that? And, and why are we afraid now of visiting cemeteries? Because they're amazing places and you're, and you're in one now. And finally, it, it would culminate in talking about people who've, ha who've actually had, you know, near-death experiences where they've been, you know, dead on the table for a minute or two or, or something like and yeah. come back and in almost universally come back with a greater sense of appreciation for their life and sometimes going out and doing more, you know, accomplishing more in their lives than they ever have before through this appreciation, You're just recognizing uh, our limits. And, and I tell, I give specific examples and the climax was to bring the whole audience on an actual on what seems to be a, a near-death experience to, to take that with me so that on the other side they can uh, all feel that sense of living life to the fullest of wanting to do that so that's so i do that that's the climax and i i'll tell you this um i did a pulse stop yeah. But I did a pulse stop in a way that it isn't just me doing it. It's like the whole audience is involved in it so that when I'm dead and then come back, they all feel that as a collective as well, so that they can all go out into the night and uh, carpe diem. That, that sounds incredible. I would have loved to have seen one of these shows. I would love to do it again. Uh, to be truthful, with pandemic, uh so many of us have lost so many people during yeah. this period of time that my right now i mean I never say never but right now my head isn't in the space where i want to do that show right now <laughs> and yeah. i don't yeah. think that the that my audience wants to see that right now because they've all been through so much so i'm trying right now to figure out what my next show is going to be yeah uh, because i in addition to a to being a performer am also uh, a writer and have other means of income. I don't have the burning necessity to, oh my God, I got to get out there and perform something right now because I got bills to pay. So yeah. I have the luxury to be an artist and sit back and let inspiration hit me and create something that I really want to put out there. Brilliant. So um, with regards to your releases, we're, we're going to get on and play the trailer to your latest release in a, in a moment. Now, over the years, you have um, you have released stuff in the past, um, but it has been uh, sort of more underground, I would say. So that's fair. Yeah, yeah. It, it's those who know know. I, I don't. I, I don't remember any. You know, totally commercial stuff hitting the shelves of every magic shop. It was always. I remember. Back in the day on, on the Green Place when, you know, you would post something up and you would have a new book out or something like that. Um, so is this your first major sort of commercial release as such? Well, this in the UK, yes. Um, yeah. I had a piece that I that was that I was absolutely my first big launch and i did it through a, a different magic shop stateside yeah and it went over very very well uh do you do you want me to to say the name yeah of yeah, it? yeah 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 okay. by all means. I, mean, I don't want to take business away from your no place. no 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 this okay. is about uh, you so, not about us 
Okay. So I, I launched a utility device called the expert, which, uh, oh, I remember that is right. Which was, which was, a, a which allowed a performer to do at the time I released it with a, with a book that I typed up just a, a pamphlet of, I don't know, four to six effects that one could do with it, but they were wildly different effects. I mean, one, the one that really took off that people really got excited about was a coin bend where you could borrow a handful of change from somebody, openly mark a coin, put it in their hands with the rest of their coins. They shake them up. You, you know, hold your hands over them and make the psychic magic happen. And when they, it, when they open their hands, that the coin, the coin that you marked and put back in their hands uh, is now bent and you're entirely clean. There's, there, there is nothing to find. Yeah. Uh, so that went great. And again, that was like 10, 15 years ago. And then about 10 years after that. So I guess it was longer than 10, 10, 15 years. I guess it was longer than 10 years ago. Cause 10 years after that, uh, the, the, the shop that was handling it and had had such success with it, uh, they came back to me and said, Hey, you know, uh, it's like a different century now and everybody wants things on video. So should we put together a DVD or a download or something? And so we, so we did that project. And so now it's available through them. They make all the gimmicks. I don't have to make them anymore, which I'm so glad because my kitchen table just didn't want to see that any more of those things. <sighs> I remember it now. Now you mentioned the word expert. I do remember it coming out. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, and ago. more recently, I've got a an ebook that that Al Kazam carries um, that is when I do walk around, I use I do a lot of palmistry. I do a lot of tarot cards and I do a lot of mentalism and uh, being able to use tarot cards that are marked is an incredible advantage. I came up with uh, my own personal marking system for tarot cards, and uh, that that system is called the is called Rider Weight Readers, and that's available through Alakazam and and you know worldwide through any number of places. Fantastic! Uh, as an ebook, uh, as a soft cover, it's only available in Chicago from a couple of dealers out here. Yeah, and and that teaches you how to mark your own tarot. Precisely, which if you're doing, if, if you're in a party situation, you're doing quick readings for people and you've got your, your past, present and future cards face down. If you know what those cards are before you turn them up, your reading suddenly is so much more prophetic. You, everything, your whole storytelling is seamless and it's, it's mind blowing. I mean, as long, yeah. as long as it isn't so obvious that, oh, he must know what the next card is, uh, it, it can be really powerful and and elevate your readings. And there's a, a wide variety of effects in the literature that use marked, that, that request marked tarot cards. But the trouble with the classic plaid backed design, I'll just hold it up just so you can see the design. Yeah. That design, which is very common on uh, a lot of tarot cards. Uh, in, in the United States, the, uh, most ubiquitous tarot card is the uh, tarot deck is the Rider Waite Smith yeah. deck made by U.S. Games, and that's the, that's the design they use. But the trouble with that design is that uh, you can't do a lot of a lot of the usual tactics. You can't scratch work is too subtle. Yeah. Um, and using you know the Ted Leslie type lettering just pops too much. It's too obvious. So I had to come up with another way and I, I did and it, it worked great for me. So I decided to share it with the rest of the community and there you go. Fantastic. So we're, we're going to get on to speaking about your new effect in a moment. I've got one more question for you really about you and performing. Are you finding now that you are getting booked more now for things like the tarot than you are the magic or is it just all one? When I do walk around, it's a it's always a mix of of those three things. It's always uh, tarot palmistry and and mind reading and, and with with maybe a little magic thrown in. Just to, I just want to have a menu of something for everyone. I know some yeah. people prefer to sit at a table and be the be the tarot reader and do that all night. 
uh, I find for my own personality, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I have friends who do that and that's their gig and it's great. Uh, personally for me, I would much rather mingle and not be tied to a table because in a large cocktail party or wedding or whatever environment you want, you can just reach more people that way. And you don't, you don't have the, they don't, they don't experience the frustration of standing in a line and you become uh, basically an emissary of the host and help make sure that the party's going great. And, you know, as people, you know, applaud or shout or give some kind of positive feedback throughout the crowd, the host sees that it makes you look good. Yeah. Yeah. Great answer as well. So let, let's um, get on to your latest product. So first of all, we'll play the trailer so everyone can see what it's about. And then we'll come back and we'll speak a little bit more about it. OK, so ladies and gentlemen, here's the trailer for Cut and Colour. So that is Cut and Colour. That's the short trailer. If you want to see a longer one, pop over to our website. There is a four and a half minute trailer where you have got a full performance. All right, it's split up, up over various performances, but there is a full performance there. So it's um, a guillotine type trick. So explain what happens during the routine because you're, you're getting mainly reactions on that teaser. Yeah. Uh because that's that's the style of trailers these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah. So, but the effect is you are able to show uh, just bare bones. You're able you're able to show a small packet of blue back cards with holes in them, front and back, and you assemble them into a rudimentary finger chopper. Uh, so you've got two, and then you put your finger through those two, and then you take the other two and insert them through the top, and then the participant can hold on to those and feel them solidly hitting your finger. They're not going anywhere. And you give them the, you, you show, again, sh you lower the front of the two protruding ones because yeah. this is an adjustable finger guillotine. If your fingers were bigger, you'd need the two in the middle, but you're only going to use one. So you, you lower, lower the front one. There's just one left. And they gently tap, and it gradually goes right through your finger, completely surrounds it. You take off the packet, show that uh, your finger is actually quite fine. You are then again able to show that all of the cards are unharmed. Uh, and then, as something they're not expecting, uh, you let them take a look, particularly at the blade card, the one that went through your finger, and they discover in their own hands that the back, which they, they'd seen all the backs before multiple times, rather than being blue is now suddenly shockingly red and oh, uh man. you and you and you get a, a choice actually uh the card can just be a red backed card or it could be a red backed blood spattered card if yeah. you're going for a more shocking bizarre kind of presentation yeah it's it's great it's just such oh wait i'm sorry go on and all the and all the other cards that are left in your hand you can then hand those out as well and those are all examinable too yeah. So you end clean. It, it's such a, a a sort of unique little close-up effect. It will be perfect. And I know this is where you use it in the mix and min mingle situation. Got a few people around you. Now, you do also sell um, packs of refills, which we have on our site. 
Now, you're not using a card every single time, but the refills are there, I believe, if you want to personalize the card as, as a giveaway. Right. The, that, that last card that, that turns red, the transformed card, or that, that, or that has blood on it, uh, you could, if you want, you could just leave it with them as a souvenir as is, or you can leave it, or when, when they discover it's red, it, they could also discover that their name's on it or that your name's on it, or that if you're doing this for a corporate event, that the company's name's on it. Um, and that can be a leave behind in that situation. So yeah. that, that's what the refills are for. They're not mandatory. You don't, you, you're not obligated to leave a souvenir, but if you're that kind of person where you think it'd be beneficial to do so, it's easy to do that. Yeah, and you've quite surprisingly in this current climate, you've priced it really reasonable, especially with the refill cards. It, they're like fifteen pounds or something for a for a whole pack. Yeah, so it's fifty four it, cards. Yeah, so it, it's pennies per performance, um, and it is it's a it's a great little effect. It's just something a little bit different. It it breaks up the standard sort of card trick or coin trick. It's just a bit interesting as well. You know, people love the finger chopper. To us magicians is quite an old type effect and a lot of people um a lot of magicians sort of poo poo it a bit and go oh, a finger chopper but it is for a lay person a good finger chopper routine is is great well and let me if, if i could say something about that uh, the classic finger chopper that we know with the little finger guillotine uh and and <laughs> when you get when, when you get this effect uh i write up everything actually in a book in a, in addition to the videos that come with it there's a there's a there's a full book that explains is, everything yeah. fully photo illustrated but i started with uh, an introductory essay about the history of the chopper yeah. and ed massey invented this you know the, the finger guillotine that we all know and then you know barely saw much money if any from it because it immediately got knocked off and now you can get it for a dollar worldwide right yeah but but i uh I've had a love-hate relationship with that effect since day one, uh, because <laughs> if, if I may get personal, uh, uh, th this effect comes directly out of childhood trauma. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Um, I was a kid at my big sister's birthday party, and my mom had hired a magic clown uh, who thought it was a good idea to have me as, what, I must have been five, put my finger into this thing with a sharp blade in it and i said no and i ran away and i i hid in the kitchen with my mother for the rest of the party and would not come out until that guy was in his van and driving away so the dynamic so it it had stuck in my mind that at some point i wanted to go back and find a good way to do this kind of effect and in doing research found out that uh herb weiner uh came up with the idea of using playing cards with holes in them, which automatically takes out the danger element and changes the effect from, hey, this dangerous thing went through your finger and you're okay, to look at this impossible thing that is happening right now. Here's a thing that couldn't possibly be going through your finger and it's going through your finger. Yeah. And that's, a, that's, a, that's more magical to me than, hey, look, I have successfully not lopped off a part of your body. So, so, that, so that's number one. And, but number two, I think, is in a lot of magic that, that was happening when I was a kid and, and that precedes it, but I, I think I've been seeing a trend towards retooling them in contemporary times, is not giving the magician all the power, giving the participant yeah. the power. I, I, uh, until fairly recently, I, in, in my day job, outside of performance performance, uh, was teaching through a nonprofit here in the States called Open Heart Magic. Uh, I was teaching volunteers to be magicians in, in pediatric wards of hospitals. Fantastic. And in that situation specifically, the magician should never be the one in power. It's always about empowering the participant. You have kids in, in beds who are going through Lord knows what, but yeah. being able to give them that sense of having some power in their lives is essential. And you know what? Even outside the hospital, that's important. Uh, there's the yeah. classic Jerry Seinfeld routine about magicians with, you know, 
every, when they make a coin vanish, it's like, see the coin? Now it's gone. You're an idiot. You know, it's, here it's back. You're a moron. <laughs> right? And, yeah. and we all know performers who still kind of treat their audiences that way. And I hope that we all aspire not to. So my approach to this effect was part of that was to specifically flip that dynamic so that they're the ones in control. They're lowering the blade and doing the magic and you're the one that it's going through. And isn't that incredible? Yeah, that that's great. It is, it's such a nice little routine. Um, I remember it, we got to be going back 25 years ago. Bromley used to have a um, finger chopper built into a deck of playing cards. So you right. would literally bring the whole deck up, put your finger through the box, bang, and then take right. it out and the whole deck sitting on your finger, which was really nice. And it reminded me of that. And that always used to get good reactions because it was just a little bit different. And, right. you know, the, the great thing about an effect like this is not only does it work very, very well in a mix and mingle and close up situation, but if you were doing a parlor type presentation or a stand up performance, okay. it, it's all happening around here as well. You're not right. down here doing stuff all happening right. around here. You can have your, your spectator up on stage or up behind your table with you, and everyone can see what's going on. And and for the for those of you who are a little bit on the finger-flinging side and appreciate slides, there's a very simple slide that's part of this that I teach, but all the handling is at your fingertips and it's vertical. So again, yeah. everything is up here. They're not looking down at your shoes. They're They're up here. Yeah, uh, and it's so it's built to, to to work in a parlor or a mix and mingle situation, uh, yeah. and everything happens here, so the whole crowd can see it. And you, people will will pull in from other places because they see something is happening up here. Yeah. Um, also, one more thing I wanted to add: the nice thing about this approach to finger chopper that I was that I'm really excited about is it finally puts an ending on this thing. You know, all yeah. too often the effect is, and I'll do what the standard is. Finger goes into the device, chop, look, you're fine. Tricks over. Next. Yeah. Right. Whereas here, the chopping is then followed by something completely unexpected. It's still organic. It still makes sense because here's something that ostensibly with went through your finger and may have had contact with the insides of your finger and has changed color to blood red. But they're not they're not expecting it. Yeah. And so that extra shock can get you a bigger reaction than even the penetration. It's, yeah. And you know, there's a name yeah. on it, so much more so. Yeah, 100%. It, it's such a great trick. Really, really good trick. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that brings us to the end of this week's Deep Dive. I just want to thank you, uh, Neil, for coming and um, obviously spending your time with us and our friends. Um it's great to finally speak to you. I, like I said, I remember you from years ago. I know we would have had correspondence in the past, but it's it's great to, to finally speak to you. And thanks for being so open about sharing things about, you know, venues, because I've been asked this question a lot recently from friends saying, oh, you know, I really want to take a show out there and do it. How do I go about it? And, you know, you know as well as... I do, that you can't just go out and hire a 500-seater or 300-seater and expect to fill it. That doesn't right. happen. Um, but I, I think the information you gave was was great and very generous to, to actually give that away. But thank you so much for, for joining us here on The Deep Dive. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you. And um, I will be back in a moment so we can have another chat, but I'm going to say goodbye to these guys. So, ladies and gentlemen, the fantastic Neil Tobin. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us on this week's Deep Dive. To learn more about Cut and Colour, pop over to the website or click. There should be a little button up here somewhere on YouTube. Click on that, take you to the product. There's also a longer trailer on there that you can watch as well that is more of a full performance. But it is a great little packet trick. Um, and it does, when Neil says it comes with a book, he it, it does. It comes with a pretty big book that he's written up. Um, it's a great trick. And uh, I know you'll enjoy it. If you want something a bit quirky, something a bit different, that's not just your standard card trick, 
then go check out Cut and Color. Now remember, before we go, if you haven't done so already, um, hit that subscribe button, that notification bell, and you'll be notified every time we go live right here on the Deep Dive and on our YouTube channel. So until next week, I'm Peter Nardi. Have yourselves a great week. And thank you so much for supporting Alex Sam and uh, our YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.